Thomas Paine was born into a family holding strong religious beliefs. His father was a member of the Society of Friends. However, because his mother was a member of the Church of England, his father was expelled from the Quakers because of his marriage outside his religious sect. Paine later wrote of his childhood education. My father being of the Quaker profession, it was my good fortune to have an exceeding good moral education and a tolerable stock of useful learning. Franklin convinced Payne that his talents would find ready employment in North America. So in 1774, Payne departed from England. He traveled as a first-class passenger and with a letter of introduction from Benjamin Franklin. One of his first essays, written in 1774 and published early in 1775 in the Pennsylvania Journal and the Weekly Advertiser, attacked the institution of slavery. His strong spirituality and sense of justice was evident. He pointed to the moral conflict of the American position. That some desperate wretches should be willing to steal and enslave men by violence and murder for gain is rather lamentable than strange. But that many civilized, nay Christianized people should approve and be concerned in the savage practice is surprising and still persist, though it has been so often proved contrary to the light of nature, to every principle of justice and humanity. With the conflict on the battlefield going poorly, Benjamin Rush approached Payne to work on a pamphlet that would explain to the colonials what was at stake in the conflict. The result, late in 1775, was common sense, published anonymously, of course, because it was a treasonous document in British eyes. Payne wrote that the purpose of the pamphlet was to rescue man from tyranny and false principles of government and enable him to be free. His words look to a deeper understanding of the human condition than could be found in instruments of law. The issues were to him on a high plane of moral obligation. He carried this perspective into his commentaries on the crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country, but he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap we esteem too lightly. Tis dearness only that gives everything its value. When the French rose up against aristocracy and Catholicism in 1789, Payne wrote to Edmund Burke optimistically about the French Revolution. However, Burke saw nothing but the destruction of time-tested institutions and relationships in the wind. He decided to go on the offensive producing Reflections on the Revolution in France, published in November of 1790. Payne felt compelled to offer a response. Payne completed Rights of Man in February 1791, and a few hundred copies were printed and sold before British authorities threatened the publisher, and all unsold copies were recalled. Payne was not intimidated and soon found another publisher. The work spread quickly throughout Britain and beyond. To Payne, the rights of man came not from government, but from a higher authority. Though I mean not to touch upon any sectarian principle of religion, yet it may be worth observing that the genealogy of Christ is traced to Adam. Why then not trace the rights of man to the creation of man? I will answer the question because there have been an upstart of governments thrusting themselves between and presumably working to unmake man. For his outspoken attacks on monarchy and aristocracy, British authorities declared Paine an enemy of the state. He eventually fled to France, where he was initially honored and welcomed as a friend of the revolution. However, 
In October of 1793, Payne was denounced and declared an enemy of France. At the end of December, he was imprisoned at Luxembourg Palace, where he remained for nearly a year. Payne's next major writing resurrected principles he shared with the great French school of political economists, the physiocrats. Agrarian Justice appeared in 1796, written in response to a sermon by the Bishop of Landaff, attempting to give divine sanction to the existing maldistribution of wealth. Payne notes that poverty is absent among the indigenous tribes of North America and is a thing created by that which is called civilized life. From this point on, for the rest of his days, Payne devoted his writing energy to the subject of religion. His final major work, The Age of Reason, was published in three parts, in 1794, 1795, and 1807. This third part of his manuscript and other writings entrusted to Madame Bonneville, executrix of Payne's will, are thought to have been destroyed by her after she reverted to Catholicism. He called upon people to use their powers of reason rather than revelation. He challenged the existence of miracles and the idea that the Bible was written by divinely inspired spokespersons for a conscious creator. The first part of the Age of Reason was an unrelenting attack on the Old Testament. Payne declared, Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting and vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we called it the word of a demon than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind, and for my part, I sincerely detest it as I detest everything that is cruel. Payne's spirituality is based on something altogether different. It is only in the creation that all our ideas and conceptions of a word of God can unite. The creation speaks a universal language, independently of human speech or human language. It is an ever-existing original which every man can read. He held institutionalized religion in contempt as yet another agent of oppression and human suffering. All national institutions of churches appear to me no other than human inventions, set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. In 1802, a tentative peace was negotiated between Britain and France, providing an opportunity for Payne to sail for the United States. Jefferson made the arrangements on his behalf. Payne arrived in Baltimore at the end of October to a rather hostile reception, but was warmly received at the Capitol by President Jefferson. Early in 1803, Republicans in New York City held a banquet in his honor. Late in the fall, he moved to his farm in New Rochelle, but ended up staying in the village. After just a few months, he was drawn back to New York City. Faced with deteriorating finances, Payne sold part of his New Rochelle property for $4,000 in 1804. His writing continued almost without pause, including a condemnation of missionaries who proselytized Indians. Commenting on Connecticut's blue laws, he wrote that they make a labor of rest, for they oblige a person to sit still from sunrise to sunset on a Sabbath day, which is hard work. The God embraced by Payne is a God quite different from the God worshiped by those who accept what is written in the ancient scriptures and texts, declared by self-proclaimed members of one priestcraft or another as the direct communications they receive from the deity. The study of theology, as it stands in Christian churches, is the study of nothing. It is founded on nothing. It rests on no principles. It provides by no authorities. It has no data. 
It can demonstrate nothing and it admits no conclusion. We can have only a confused idea of his power if we have not the means of comprehending something of its immensity. We can have no idea of his wisdom but by knowing the order and manner in which it acts. The principles of science lead to this knowledge, for the creator of man is the creator of science, and it is through that medium that man can see God, as it were, face to face. It is only by the exercise of reason that man can discover God, take away that reason, and he would be incapable of understanding anything. The Almighty Lecturer by displaying the principles of science in the structure of the universe has invited man to study and to imitation. It is as if he had said to the inhabitants of this globe that we call ours, I have made an earth for man to dwell upon, and I have rendered the starry heavens visible to teach him science and the arts. He can now provide for his own comfort and learn from my munificence to all to be kind to each other. The age of ignorance commenced with the Christian system, which was only another species of mythology. To pain, the special capacities of the human species to contemplate the operation of nature and apply scientific investigations toward a greater understanding thereof was the great gift of the Creator. Paine's views on organized religion and the church troubled many of his longtime associates in the cause of liberty, including Samuel Adams. Adams wrote to Paine that when he heard Paine had turned his mind to a defense of infidelity, I felt myself much astonished. Paine wrote in response, The case, my friend, is that the world has been overrun with fable and creeds of human inventions with sectaries of whole nations against all other nations, and sectaries of those sectaries in each of them against each other. Every sectary except the Quakers has been a persecutor. The key to heaven is not in the keeping of any sect, nor ought the road to it be obstructed by any. Paine periodically signed essays and articles, a true deist, or a member of the deistical church or similar pseudonyms. By this time, however, his health was also failing. Still, he continued to write on religion. In September of 1804, he attacked missionaries who used the Bible to proselytize among the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Will the prisoners they take in war be treated the better by their knowing the horrid story of Samuel's brewing agog in pieces like a block of wood, or David's putting them under the harrows of iron? A few days before Payne's death in 1809, he was visited by two clergymen who reportedly said to him, You have now a full view of death. You cannot live long and whosoever does not believe in Jesus Christ will assuredly be damned. Payne managed to raise himself up from the bed to rid himself of their presence. Let me have none of your popish stuff. Get away with you. Payne took his final breath early in the morning of the 8th of June, 1809 largely because of his attacks on organized religion. His death was mourned by few. Not even Thomas Jefferson took the time to make a public comment. James Cheatham published a brief comment in his newspaper, The American Citizen. I am unacquainted with his age, but he had lived long, done some good, and much harm. The influence of Thomas Paine's thinking continues. Today we have to deal with the relationship between the state and organized religion. We are far from agreement on what that relation ought to be. Thomas Paine's insights are valuable as we think about what should be done going forward.